Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPT Podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate on test day. So today we've got a practice question related to the integumentary system. This one going through content you need to know about interventions for the integumentary system, specifically neuropathic ulcers. But before we get to that, just a quick reminder, you can find all of our cheat sheets, tips, tricks, all of it over at ptfinalexam.com slash podcast. So if you haven't signed up over there, it's a great way to stay on the list. Make sure that you are getting the most up-to-date content, that you get all of our current uh, course offerings, get all of our discounts as we run them. Uh, be sure to check that out at ptfinalexam.com slash podcast. And if you haven't yet, be sure to leave us a five-star review over on Google Play, Apple iTunes, Spotify, wherever it is you're listening to this podcast as we strive to get the word out. It's always much appreciated. And also as we begin, just let me tell you thank you. Thank you for what you do. I know that as you are preparing for this exam, it is quite difficult. It can be a very lengthy process. I know that especially those of you who are facing this exam for a multiple attempt, so after at least one fa one failed attempt or, or even more, that it can be quite daunting just to crack open the books again. So uh, I've got other episodes talking about the grieving process and what it takes to, to actually re- engage with the material after a failed attempt. Uh, I know that it's a difficult process, but let me tell you, it's one of those things where we may not love the process, but we really love the result. What we're targeting is licensed and qualified to be a licensed and qualified practitioner. And I think that's something you would agree with me is both a worthwhile and worthy goal. And so, albeit this can be a rather difficult process to get through this, uh, let me tell you, it's worth it being on the other side of this, that it can absolutely totally change and bless your life for now and for many years to come. So absolutely worth it. Stick with it. Keep a grin on your chin as you go through all this because it's uh, it's a great goal. And honestly, as I like to mention, this is the, the intersection of your interest and your skill. And so it makes for a great, uh, really such a great career. So uh, just kudos to you for what you're doing here. All right, so as we dive into this question, we've got a practice question for you. The integumentary system, so on test day, as you know, in this podcast, we go through all of the systems on the FSBPT's content outline. It has recently been updated for the 2024 content outline update. Uh, the material didn't substantively change, but there are some small changes in the proportion of questions. The integumentary system, you can expect somewhere between eight and 11 questions on this, ranging all the way from T PT examination through differential diagnosis to interventions. So it's not a, a huge system on the exam. However, it is of, of great importance because honestly, every question counts and no question counts more than any other question. And so uh, let's say you bomb the cardiovascular and pulmonary system. Well, hopefully you do well in all the other systems and you can counteract that. And I guess point is you want to make sure to perform well in all the systems as best you can. But just so you know, you don't want to forego some of these other systems uh, because honestly, 25% of the test is related to that. And you want to make sure to be spending plenty of time with these, the other systems and non-systems. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into our question here today. So as per our usual, I will read to you the question, give you a moment to respond, and then we'll talk about it together. Which of the following precautions is most important when working with patients with infected neuropathic ulcers? So which of the following precautions is most important when working with patients with infected neuropathic ulcers? Option one, the patient may demonstrate exaggerated signs of infection. Two, the patient should always be monitored for signs of hypoglycemia. Three, the patient should apply moisturizing lotion liberally between the toes. And four, the patient should wear socks with seams at the toes. So again, which of the following precautions is most important when working with patients with infected neuropathic ulcers? Option one, the patient may demonstrate exaggerated signs of infection. Two, the patient should always be monitored for signs of hypoglycemia. Three, the patient should apply moisturizing lotion liberally between the toes. And four, the patient should wear socks with seams at the toes. All right, so this question talking about precautions related to neuropathic ulcers. Now, remember, neuropathic ulcers are often described as diabetic neuropathic ulcers. And so it's it's implicit in the neuropathic ulcer that there is some type of, of glucose and poor, poor glucose regulation. And in fact, often these are, are simply called diabetic ulcers or diabetic ulceration. And so neuropathic ulcers, the key with neuropathy or neuropathic ulcers is that the loss of vascular supply to the cells, especially in the periphery and in the eyes, 
All this can lead to, especially in the feet, can lead to ulceration, especially after any type of, of minor trauma. This can occur with your patients. And so therefore, uh, on the list of things that your patients would be required to do or should do is you'd want to make sure that they have adequate foot hygiene and adequate footwear. So uh, as far as the correct answer here, the correct answer here is the patient should always be monitored for signs of hypoglycemia. Uh, the incorrect answer options are related to uh, some of the foot hygiene. So number the option three, the patient should apply moisturizing lotion liberally between the toes. Actually, the patient should apply moisturizing lotion everywhere where else except between the toes. And this is because if you get the, the area between the toes too moist, you can get maceration and fungal uh, colonization. So you don't want fungus to grow there. And uh, frankly, you want to make sure to dry off the foot completely after any type of, of bath or shower. You dry them off completely when they've been wet, especially between the toes. And then you apply moisturizing lotion to the heels, especially the plantar surface. But you apply moisturizing lotion everywhere except between the toes. Also of note, when it comes to footwear, you want to make sure to have an ample toe box. And if the socks do have seams at the toes, you want to make sure to have the toe or have the, the socks inside out because the seams at the toes would or could cause undue pressure at the tips of the toes. And so we're talking about a seam in the fabric. Ideally, your patient socks would not have any seams at the toes simply because that would it causes undue pressure of the toes and it's it's ill-advised and so the patient should as avoid as much as possible uh, avoid wearing socks with seams at the toes and then finally the last incorrect answer is the patient may demonstrate exaggerated signs of infection when in fact it's the opposite they will have diminished or fewer signs of 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 infection the cardinal signs of infection such as the inflammatory response uh, purulent discharge excessive uh, yeah excessive discharge or um, yeah, fluid discharge from the, from the wound. This is because of the poor vascularity of the foot. They are unlikely to show the increased temperature and increased inflammatory response. And so therefore patients who may be cooking up an infection, they, it's quite possible they'll have a diminished or decreased sign of infection. So what about the correct answer here? The correct answer is the patient should always be monitored for, monitored for signs of hypoglycemia. So you have to follow this pathway a little bit. So in the case, and in the question, it talks about a patient with an infected neuropathic ulcer. So in patients with infected ulcers, this does tend to increase blood glucose levels. So stress on the body, uh, it's really the cortisol system, you're causing increased stress. And so therefore you're flooding your, your bloodstream with glucose. So that would be counteracted by insulin or whatever type of, of glucose mediating medication the patient is using. Um, point being that one, as you try to counteract that, it can lead to, so as the infection, ideally as your intervention is improving or decreasing the infection or the severity of the neuropathic wound, they will be on ostensibly on too much medication, which could cause hypoglycemia, especially combined with exercise. And so the risk of hypoglycemic episodes are greatly increased when the patient has an infected neuropathic ulcer, simply because it pulls things out of balance and it, it makes it harder to, to titrate the patient's blood glucose. So all that to say that a patient with an infected wound is likely to have hyperglycemia, which would then be treated with, and that's what's constantly being monitored by, uh, as they check their blood, blood glucose multiple times a day. So they're likely to be increasing, the physician will likely be increasing the amount of insulin or any type of glucose mediating medication, which could then lead to a kind of an overcompensation. So as the patient improves or as the patient is is as the infection is is ameliorating, you would note that the patient would be at a much higher risk for hypoglycemia. So there you go. Bottom line is these patients with infected neuropathic ulcers, you have to continuously monitor them for hypoglycemia, the signs of hypoglycemia. So shakiness, weakness, hunger, uh, syncope, all the things like, uh, I think all of us have that experience to, to some extent when we're quite hungry and shaky or as uh, like in my kids to be quite hangry uh, so irritability, irritability is high on that list as well. So the signs of hypoglycemia are, are easily recognizable. All right, so there you go. There's your practice question for today about the integumentary system. Uh, be sure to check out all the other episodes we've got here on the NPTE podcast. Uh, if you haven't yet, be sure to leave us a five-star review. It always helps as we're getting the word out. And uh, yeah, have a, have, have a fabulous day. Good luck studying. We'll crane fist pumps all around and I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.